Good afternoon. Welcome to Preservation Connecticut's Fall 2022 series talking about preservation, our noontime chats about everything preservation. I'm Jane Montanaro, Executive Director of Preservation Connecticut, and I'm pleased to be your host. Today we are chatting about when preservation isn't possible with May Bowley, Executive Director of Repurpose Savannah. But before I hand the controls over to May, let me give you a brief intro into Preservation Connecticut. Preservation Connecticut is the statewide private nonprofit historic preservation organization founded in 1975 by a special act of the Connecticut General Assembly as the Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation to preserve, protect, and promote the building sites and landscapes that contribute to the heritage and vitality of Connecticut's communities. We are statutory partners with the Connecticut State Historic Preservation Office and I'm proud to say that for over four decades, we have successfully, successfully championed the protection of remarkable community assets all over the state by leveraging funding, advocating, forming partnerships, and promoting stewardship. Our office is on Whitney Avenue in Hamden, Connecticut. Shown here, it's listed on the National Register of Historic Places, the Eli Whitney Boarding House, built in, in 1827 to house workers for Eli Whitney's Gun Factory, and it served as Preservation Connecticut's headquarters since 1989. We have a staff of nine preservation professionals and a board of 21 preservationists from around the state. Staff listed here are always available to assist with inquiries. Chris Wiegren, is our deputy director. Contact Chris for information on historic preservation easements, our bi-monthly magazine, Connecticut Preservation News, our Olmsted in Connecticut landscape survey, and to arrange book talks for his book, Connecticut Architecture, Stories of 100 Places. Renee Trebert, Making Places and Preservation Services Manager. Please contact Renee for information on redevelopment of historic industrial sites, and tax credit applications. Jordan Sorensen is our development and special projects manager. Jordan manages our communications and outreach to members through social media and email, receives and monitors demolition notices from municipalities, and prepares historic tax credit applications and nominations to the state and national register of historic places. Kristen Hopewood is our development assistant. She manages all of the inquiries that come through our website, provides member services, arranges special events, and is the editor of our Historic Properties Exchange, a free listing of, of threatened historic properties. And finally, our team of circuit riders, Brad Scheid, Mike Farino, and Stacey Vero. Oh, and Steph Stefan Dan Danchuk. They provide immediate boots on the ground service to homeowners, developers, municipal leaders, nonprofit organizations, museums, historic district commissions, and more with an array of preservation technical assistance, including community organizing, prioritizing maintenance and repairs, historic designations, funding, and archeology. span These chats have served as a meaningful way for us to continue our mission during the pandemic. We've been able to connect with the public and hear what's on your mind. Please feel free to use the chat feature to ask questions, ask questions directly at the end of the presentation, or of course, contact us afterwards for a site visit or a call. And a quick sneak peek, next week we'll be talking with Mason Lord about his initiative, Touch a Trade, which aims to engage young people in the trades. So with that, I am really excited to welcome May and hand the controls over to her. So May, I will stop my screen share. Thank you, Jane. Um, my name is May, as she said. I'm very excited to be here chatting with y'all today. Just going to put this presentation up. Okay, there we go. All right, well, thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, what a great organization and such an honor to be included in your series. Um, I, we were chatting a little bit before we got started about how important it is that my industry of deconstruction and y'all's industry of preservation really start to realize and embrace that overlap that naturally exists and how this can benefit so much, um, so many people in our community. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and dive right in. So um, what is deconstruction? 
I'd love to tell you. It's not always intuitive right out of the bat, especially if you're not sunk in like some of us are. <laughs> I'm living this every single day. Um, so let's just talk about what it actually is and what it is not. Deconstruction is the systematic removal of a building, typically in the reverse order in which it was built. So you uh, you just take exactly that process of putting a building together and you just go backwards. You take out the insides first. You start with that roof. You take it off and then down to the walls and down into the foundation. It is a careful process if you're doing it right. Uh, it is a, a um, much more sensitive way to accomplish uh, essentially the same end of structural removal, but without all of the collateral damage that's associated with it loss in both material and in an ideological sense. So um, there's many, many, many things which are described in the use of the word deconstruction. Um, probably the one that most people are most common with, especially in the preservation world, is what I like to call non-structural deconstruction. This is also commonly referred to as architectural salvage. It's going in and getting the pretty bits that are on the surface of a building. It's the finish. Uh, it's your windows, your doors, your mantles, corbels, um, sometimes even flooring if it's not structural to the, bu to the building. Uh, this is a lovely way to preserve elements. It definitely doesn't disturb the building um, in any way, so it's quite safe. Um, and, and you can, and you can get a lot of uh, really important features that are highly reusable in other projects in this manner. Um, this is probably what most skeptics are thinking about when they're, when they're approaching this idea of deconstruction from a preservation lens. This is what I call structurally compromising decon. I refer to these people, the operators as sort of the poachers of our industry. They're going into buildings, historic buildings. They're going in for a monetary profit. They're looking for uh, the bits of framing and old growth lumber that are going to get them high value on the market. They're going to take them out in ways that often compromise the structure, make it unsafe to be in, and, and will accelerate its loss if that loss wasn't already, um, you know, fated. In some cases, a building maybe was slated for restoration, and then poachers came in and compromised it to the point that it had to be demolished. So this is what we are trying to battle. This is the legacy of salvage for the last several decades in our country, and it is not the ideal way to talk about material preservation. Uh, you know, this is the more that preservation embraces uh, deconstruction as an aspect of it, and I use the phrase material preservation all the time to sort of extend that conversation beyond the whole building and into its parts. Um, if we're not if we're not setting the stage for this and how it ought to be done, we're leaving it sort of to the wolves, and we need to put the wolves out of business. Like they, this is this should not be uh, what what is done. The third kind of decon, what my company does, is we provide full service structural removal. It is comprehensive. In our case, we've really emphasized service, uh, so we like to make it easy for our clients. So we cover permitting. We remove the entire building. We work with all your utilities. We work with all the subs that are necessary. We're gonna take out all the masonry on your site and we're gonna leave you with a rate clean finish site that's ready for grade or whatever, or, or, or safe to just um, resume being vacant land or whatever the fate of this is. Um, it's full service, it is professional and it is regulated, it's licensed and uh, we have permission to do this. We're never going into buildings where we don't have permission to be there. Um, why is deconstruction important? This is my most common phrase. Deconstruction is an alternative to demolition. It is not an alternative to preservation. I think a lot of folks are worried that deconstruction is going to provide people with um, more of a reason to tear down historic buildings. Uh, and I can tell, and I will talk a, a good bit in this presentation about how that's that's not true. That's a misconception. Deconstruction is a way to replace the short-sighted and destructive um, structural removal method of demolition with something that's much more thoughtful and where we can do a lot of learning, education, and research heritage and documentation instead. This is always the last case scenario. This is always when all the efforts to save a building in place have failed. Uh, we wish that never happened. Unfortunately, it does happen. So I refer to that as we have to accept the fact of structural loss. We all wish it wasn't the case. I love to say 
the day that we're successful keeping every historic building standing is the day that I will happily hang up my crowbar and I will go get another job. But until that happens, we have a lot of work to do. We need to be taking care of these things even in their demise. Um, there's also a real need for in-kind materials in preservation that Secretary of Interior Standards do specify that the highest and best materials to be used in a restoration are in kind. And this can most often, it should include also age, uh, not just shape, you know, and style, but also heritage materials um, are a much better match for, for, for stitching into an existing building that is built out of heritage materials. They're going to match the, in, the durability of those materials in context, and they're going to last a lot longer than, for example, doing the siding repair with new siding. You're going to see that that repair fail a lot sooner than you're gonna see the historic sightings fail. So best practice is to use historic materials to resort, restore historic um, buildings. Heritage materials are finite. They are irreplaceable. We only have so much of it that exists. Uh, every time we throw one away, we are shrinking the size of that material pool. So we gotta do a lot to try to keep that available to us because much like an organ donor, a building, a historic building at the end of its life can then donate its pieces to help keep many other buildings in good health and good repair. And that's how it needs to breathe. We all know that we are in the middle of an environmental crisis. Uh, I'm gonna talk a lot about the environmental aspects of this. It's really nice to see the preservation community uh, embracing sustainability in conversation and looking to be a leader in sustainability in the built environment. I mean, we all know that the most sustainable building is one that already exists. So it's a natural fit for preservation and sustainability to become friends. Uh, and this deconstruction is an excellent way to do that. We also know that demolition represents a major public health concern. We all know that demolition is essentially air pollution. You're creating a pretty toxic dust cloud that is often full of, full of hazardous materials that may or may not have been identified or abated before that demolition occurred. Um, these public health concerns disproportionately affect some communities over others, and that's something we need to take a hard look at. And when we're talking about the removal of buildings and we look at the correlation between what buildings are being removed and whose histories are there, we start to see that this is tantamount to the erasure of local histories. We can change that. We can tie uh, preservation ideals to the removal of buildings such that it's more of a celebration of local histories than even when the building was sitting vacant for a decade. Um, so this is an opportunity to really shine a light on some of the histories which have been less emphasized in our historic record. So let me just dive in. Uh, the sustainability conversation. Construction and demolition generates more than twice as much waste as every city and town in America combined. If we put all of the municipal solid waste from every civilization in America <laughs> in one pile, that pile is less than half the size of what the construction and demolition pile is every year. This should shock you. This shocked me when I learned about this. I had no idea that we were creating so much garbage. And in fact, if you zoom out, this is a, a snapshot of the US. And if you, um, I, I like to say uh, in America, the average house is roughly the same amount of tonnage as an American generates in their entire lifetime. So uh, with every house we keep out of the landfill, we're offsetting an entire American's life worth of garbage. So uh, we feel like everybody on her crew has already been absolved. Just kidding. And now we're working on absolving each of you one by one. <laughs> um, so the BBC just put out a study recently suggesting that uh, on global scale, construction and demolition generates a third of the world's waste. That is far, far too much for a single industry. And think about the impact that we can have on climate change if we are addressing with a third of the world's waste in a single industry. This is such an opportunity to do better. And this not only includes what we're throwing away as a result of demolition, this also includes what we're extracting and all of the waste that goes into the extraction of new materials. Both of these are addressed by material reuse in our community. So I'll walk you through a little bit of uh, what was and what can be. So trees eat carbon. They eat carbon dioxide for a living. They're super good at their job. We cut down trees and we make them into buildings. We've done this for as long as we've been on this planet. Um, as those buildings begin to age, a lot of times they're identified as a risk or a liability. Uh, not every homeowner is preservation minded. Not every homeowner has the 
uh, funds to restore their building. And a lot of times risk and liability is being assessed by the city who's then left holding the bag with these historic buildings. And so unfortunately that's a sort of deficit vision looking at this uh, aging building stock. So the solution has been, let's landfill them. Let's get them out of here and uh, out of sight, out of mind, problem solved. And then when that happens, all that carbon dioxide, which was eaten up by those trees is spit back into the atmosphere, accelerating climate change. This of course increases the intensity of storms and the frequency of storms, which then increases the risk and liability of your aging building stocks. So this is a vicious cycle. Um, how did we get here? I think this is one of the most fascinating aspects of modern demolition is that it is a newfangled idea and yet it has become so ubiquitous that most of us don't even realize that there are other ways. I mean, it has monopolized the market as the only service for structural removal. And it is our job to remind people that that hasn't always been the case. Uh, demolition as we know it is the birth child of World War II. Uh, major earth moving technology such as the bulldozer was developed not to demolish American homes, but actually to uh, create logistical success in the European theater during the war. Uh, World War II historians will tell you about the CBs and what a huge impact that they made. This is the engineering core. They were designed and implemented to help move troops, tanks, and machinery and equipment through the landscape. They were designed to help clear rubble after a bombing so that you could move quickly from A to B. And a lot of people will credit them for having a major impact in our success in World War II and the Allied victory. But after World War II, of course, uh, as in so many cases, that technology and the literal millions of young men who had been trained in this work were brought home and they were put to work in the domestic landscape. And uh, that resulted in such projects as you'll be familiar with as urban renewal. What do we do with all these bulldozers and all these people who know how to drive them? Well, we'll just demolish everything. That's a good way. Um, sure, we'll just clear everything. Uh, we'll put it all in the garbage and we'll, we'll sail into the new world of the bright, shiny 1950s of American consumerism. And, and this is gonna be the way we do it. Um, but what happened before that? I mean, that was less than 100 years ago. We're looking at like maybe 80 years worth of technology development. That's a lifetime, of course, so we don't have the, the memory of what was there before. But fortunately, as we all know, uh, archives and research can show and shine a light on what existed before bulldozers started knocking down everything. Um, and that, and surprise, the answer is it was deconstruction. So the common practice uh, for building removal for most of human history has been to salvage and reuse the materials in that building. It didn't really make any sense to take perfectly good building materials and put them in the garbage considering how much work it took to make them in the first place and how they usually are right there in the context of where the next building is going to be. So I always reference, uh, I love to reference this lovely article by my dear friend Allison Arlotta. Um, and she has this wonderful line, disassembly and reuse of building materials is a practice as old as building itself. That's very true. Her article focuses particularly on deconstruction in New York City, uh, right in your neighborhood, um, around the turn of the century. And there's a really cool time-lapse video of like, I mean, a massive New York commercial building being taken apart brick by brick. Uh, this was normal. I encourage you to dig into the historic record in your community and see if you can find evidence of hand wreckers that was a really common term that was used. And, and, and discount material retailers, they, they, were, they were as common in the day as, as new material. In fact, maybe more common than new material dealers. And how do I know that this is true also in Savannah, not just in New York? Well, I take buildings apart for a living. This is what I do every day. And I see evidence of building material reuse in every building that I deconstruct. I have never taken apart a building that didn't have something in it that was reused from a former life. This is, this is just historic building reality. Here's a great example. I'm gonna show you a few examples. This is the worker's cottage, super charming, very small, um, originally a timber frame cottage with a number of additions on the back. This one's getting fully restored. Um, my client is gonna move into this house. It's really exciting. But there were a number of historical additions on the back end that were in really bad, bad condition. So we, we sensitively deconstructed those additions and he reused a lot of these materials in the, in the restoration and reconstruction of the building. So that's awesome, that's a win. And you can see in this photo, there are a couple of boards that have some like really interesting little paint colors going on. Nobody went up into this roof after it was built, but before they drywalled it, 
and painted just like this piece blue and this piece yellow. Like those boards were painted in their original expression and they were reused in this roof. Paint is usually our, you know, dead giveaway that this is a reused building material. Also, there are a number of other ways, the age of the material in comparison to the ones next to it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is the Mercer Cottage here in uh, Burnside Island, which is really close to the city of Savannah. And we oh, were so excited to take this building apart. We were really upset it was getting lost. It's such a cool landmark. Um, this was the home or the island home, the sort of summer home of Johnny Mercer's uncle, Robert Mercer. So Johnny Mercer, um, famous George's son who wrote the song Moon River, um, which was featured in the film Breakfast at Tiffany's. He grew up in this house. He spent his summers and actually the river that is right behind this house is Moon River. So we like to think he was thinking about his time in this house when he was in New York writing that song. And when we were taking this one apart, we found outboard motor crates from Waukegan, Illinois, that somebody had used to clad the interior of the wall and had these really cool embossed logos on them. And that just, that made my day. Um, brick is one that is a highly reusable material. Brick is heavy. Shipping brick across the country is expensive. People would think you were crazy if you told them back in 1915 when this building was built that they should import brand new brick rather than using the brick from the house that was just taken apart right next door. So the brick we found in this building, um, Hattie House, as we called it, is much older, more than 50 years older than the building that it appeared in. So either this brick was harvested, and, and we know that because all local brick that was produced in Savannah was produced before the Civil War. With the abolition of slavery, labor, labor costs basically brought an end to the manufacturing of brick in, in the Southeast, in our region. These are hand formed and made by enslaved peoples. They have fingerprints in them. Uh, so either they were in an older building and then were reused in this building, or they sat around in a brickyard for over 50 years. We can't prove which happened, but you take your guess what's more likely. Um, here's a great example. Uh, this was our, our project called the Crest Hill Bungalow, super cute, a little 40s, 50s house. And when we first cracked into it, I started in the stairwell and I got really excited because I saw this beautiful old growth longleaf pine and I thought, oh my word, this building is much, much older than we thought. And then of course we opened it up more and we realized, no, no, <laughs> the building is as old as we thought it was, like 40s, 50s. Somebody had put a Victorian era staircase in this building at some point in its life when they wanted to convert the attic into livable space. Uh, here's another 1950s garage that had older materials in it. And again, the paint is the dead giveaway. All of this would have been covered with drywall. You would never have seen this. These boards were obviously in an earlier expression where uh, you can see probably a stud was passing over those spots where the paint didn't touch. And in this case, you can actually see the nail is still in there. Nobody even bothered to pull the nail out. They just slapped it back on a new building. Um, this is one of my favorite projects we've ever done, Hearn Hideaway, it's my background. Um, this was such a great uh, reuse example. You can see in the attic, the attic studs on one of the end gables were made of rafters from an older building. And there's your little bird mouth cut in. Uh, and these were all clearly from the same roof. Uh, we think because this is quite a remote location, sort of like far from town, we think that there was a cottage on this property that was deconstructed and then they just kept the materials right there and reused them in the building of this house because there's so much consistency in what we see in the reclaimed, in the reclaimed goods. Here is that same house with all of the finish taken off, all the siding removed and everything. And you can see plain as day, how many of those boards have a little paint on them. Some of them have stain on them. Some of them have little cuts in them, little corners taken out from where they would have passed over a window, but then now they're not. So much reused material in this building. Absolutely beautiful um, and such a testament to the historic, um, let's say the uh, historic accuracy of what we're trying to talk about. Deconstruction is also a wonderful opportunity to educate. It is slower and it is more careful. It is more thoughtful than crushing the building and getting it out of there in a day. So we like to take that time to invite school groups to come out and take a look at their historic buildings, not just, you know, students who are interested in deconstruction, of course, but then also preservation students. You can learn so much about a historic building if you get to peek inside the walls. And we don't always get to see this much inside of our buildings that are being restored or, or, or have been maintained in restoration, you know, throughout their life. They're not going to be exposing those, those framing elements in the same way that we get to do on every job. 
So we are building an archive of knowledge about historic construction practices. And we really try to document and emphasize the opportunity that this is to learn about how historic buildings were built. Um, as I said, documentation is huge for us. Uh, every project that we do, we have we documented this as fully as we can, and in some cases to extreme detail if it was really special. And that's because, you know, if it's going to be gone, we don't think it needs to be entirely gone. Like it can live on in our thoughts and minds, and then every single piece of that material can have the story and the reality and the histories of where it came from attached to it, and it can continue to live. The stories can continue to breathe in our community. This house, we were lucky. We were hired to take it down and in the course by a historical society much like yours the historic savannah foundation and they uh they bought the building to save it with their revolving fund and it tragically caught on fire it was really bad fire uh it was also a hoarder house so combination of like all the stuff and the fire and it was just like really bad in there so they hired us to take it down and in the course of doing so you know we cleaned out all the junk and all the ash and the burned and the melted nonsense and we started to take it apart and we realized the framing had kind of been protected from the fire by all the stuff in the house. So once we got it kind of cleaned out, we were able to be like, hold on, stop, pause, like historical society, come out, take a look at this. We actually think that this building can be saved. And they were like, yes, we got engineers out to verify that it was still structurally sound. And yes, we could save this building. So we settled on our contract, happily walked away from this project. And now it is um, in, in full swing restoration right now. So that's such a success story. And that would not have been possible if we hadn't been here providing that service. If we hadn't been here for them to, to hire, they would have had to hire a demo company and this building would be in the landfill right now. Um, as I said, you know, not just documentation, but also research. We love to go through the property records and find out the chain of title, who owned the building, who lived in the building, what were the contexts of the building, what was the neighborhood about, was it industry housing, was it uh, white collar housing, like how, how can we paint a picture of what what this building was like, not only in its object reality, but also in its context. Uh, and as we do more and more of this, we're really starting to build a sense of this sort of time capsule of these neighborhoods that we get to work in. And again, also an opportunity while we do our professional documentation, we love to tell students, here's a great chance to try your hand. We're gonna get it professionally documented. You try to do your documentation as well. We'll compare, we'll see how you can and get better at this. And of course, we all love our historic Sanborn maps. These are some of our most important resources for understanding what the original expression of the building was and how it may have evolved over time. These things do evolve. They're constantly being modified and changed. And it's so fun for us to sort of reverse engineer and do like forensic science on the building to understand how it changed through its life time. And, and materiality is really important in being able to do that. So the more material we handle, the more familiar we get with how the lumber industry changed, how the forest industry changed, help us date the additions on a building to a really specific degree. We are also getting like nutty with our documentation at this point. We have connected with a local company that does drone footage and drone scans, and they have a service that will 3D scan your building. Most of their clients are real estate agents. They want to provide a virtual tour of a property that you could buy on the internet so you can buy it from anywhere in the country. So you can, you know, go on real estate websites and walk around these houses. We're like, we can do that. So we get the drones in and we capture the building in three dimensions before we touch it. You know, we document it so that you can still walk through this house today, even though it doesn't exist in the landscape anymore. And we go to the extent that we do, we do this twice. So we do it once when we get the contract, capture it exactly as it is. You know, we clean it up real nice, get the stuff out, capture the building as it was the day we met it. And then when we're done gutting the interior and we're back to the framing, we scan it again. And that goes into our archive. So you can now have like a growing uh, sort of database of the interior, the framing of these historic buildings in our area. This is a resource that I use. I will sometimes go into our scans of other buildings to try to figure out maybe how a project that we're looking at might, might be built. And building technology really did change <laughs> over time. Of course, we don't build buildings now the same way that we used to. Um, we built them the same way for a long time. And then there was this rapid period of change, sort of from the turn of the century up until modernity. And uh, as those practices change, you know, it really helps us with our safety, 
to know where in that evolution this building might be so we can anticipate how it may have settled, where the weak points may be, where it's the strongest, where we can really rely on the structure, where we may need to shore it up in order to carefully take it, take it down safely. Um, so that's our documentation pitch. Uh, I hope you will agree that this is such an opportunity to really capture these things. They don't have to be gone forever. And in fact, in many cases, I feel that our work triggers a lot more engagement with the history of a building than, than had occurred in maybe the decade or two that it sat vacant, still in place. And as I said, you know, all that research goes into a living archive on our website. You can access it. Anybody can access it. And, and anybody who buys a piece of that building is going to be given that history. In fact, I don't give them an option. It comes in your receipt. There's a link. Like You have to engage with the history of what you've just bought because uh, you need to know what it is. But Let's also talk about that human context. You know, I mentioned the air pollution that is associated with demolition. Uh, and, and we decided to take a look at who's being affected. So in our community, we took one year's worth of residential demo permits and we just did a quick analysis. And you can see that almost all of the buildings that were being demolished were historic buildings, like almost all of them. So we decided to see okay, uh, well, who, who lives around these buildings? So we, we drew a circle of an eighth of a mile around each one of these, and we took that to the uh, EPA's environmental justice mapping tool. And we were able to see the, the lead paint indicator within an eighth of a mile, 72. The person of color population within an eighth of a mile was 88%. And the low income population within an eighth of a mile was 84%. And that means that disproportionately our lower income and marginalized groups are the ones that are bearing the brunt of the public health crisis associated with demolition. And we need to take a hard look at this and do a lot better by our communities. This is just not fair. All right. Uh, I also mentioned that erasure is a problem. And if the bulk of the houses that are being demolished are in low income communities and African American communities, what, whose histories are those that we're putting in the landfill? It's those same communities. So it's our pleasure and our honor to dig in on the research of these projects. And instead of making them out of sight, out of mind, it's an opportunity to really celebrate an aspect of our local history that has not been prioritized by the preservation community. It, you know, we all know that preservation can have a bit of a legacy of telling certain stories more than other stories. And we know that collectively as an industry, we're working to shift that and be more inclusive. This is wonderful. This is how it needs to go. We're excited to play our part in that and to shine light on, in this case, uh, my client, Mary Simmons, her great, great, great grandfather purchased this land back in, eight, in the 1880s and her family's been on the property ever since. I mean, what a fascinating history um, and really our honor to be able to share this with our community, but also to just, you know, also give it back to her and her family. They knew a lot of their own history, but we found stuff that they didn't even have. And we're able to contribute to that nice, beautiful picture of, of the family legacy in this, in this community, which was actually settled. It was one of the settlements of um, freed formerly enslaved people after the Civil War. Um, so we're going to look at that same map from before. And I'm going to say, here's how we can do it differently. Trees eat your carbon dioxide. We cut down trees and we make buildings. We realize as they start to age that this is an asset to our community, not only rich with materials, which can help keep other buildings in repair, but also rich with histories that can help increase our knowledge of the past and help round out our picture of what our, our history and our local community was like. When we can look at it, not with that deficit vision, but with this like abundance vision, we can then take those assets, we can deconstruct for materials. And rather than just riding in a landfill, these are doing good in our community. They're creating meaning. They're, they're con contributing to those conversations and our knowledge about our own past. They're also creating jobs. Deconstruction requires six times more labor than demolition. It's not just, I call them bubba in a backhoe. It's not just somebody driving a machine, cutting it down and another knocking it down and another person taking it to the dump. It's like six times that many people in there with their hands, earning a great wage, uh, having a fulfilling job and doing good in their community. There's also a product as a result of this that has actual value. I like to talk about this because not everybody is a preservationist. God, I wish they were uh, in a perfect world. But if you don't care about history and if you don't care about sustainability, maybe you care about money. And let me tell you how much money you guys are throwing in the garbage. <laughs> There's a value to this product. Uh, it, it is marketable. There is a demand. Um, let's just make it available to people. 
and let's use that, of course, to generate a circular economy. So those materials can then go into repair the other buildings that are failing, so they don't have to be taken down in the first place. The whole goal of this is to save as many buildings as possible. And an abundance of, of historic materials really does help. It does help an ecosystem keep more of its buildings standing. We can back this up with data from cities that have been doing this for a long time. Our supply is local. We've just gone through this pandemic. What a horrible time. We all know that, you know, lumber in particular, you know, became really scarce. The price of it skyrocketed. It was like national news. The cost of a two by four is what? So, uh, and that was because of supply chain issues, because all of our building materials are dependent upon these international supply chains, which were rocked by this global crisis. My supply is local. If anything, we had more than ever uh, it was hard to see the, the demolition boom, the construction boom result in the tearing down of more historic buildings than ever. But it did mean that we had so many materials. We had so many opportunities to go and save these things. So I didn't have to raise my prices a single penny. The market sort of rose to meet us where we were. A lot of people who couldn't stomach spending a lot of money on a really poor quality, brand new two by four, will come and use something historic instead, because if it's gonna cost you a little bit more, you might as well get something that's super good quality or that has beautiful character. Uh, we really do strive to keep our prices low. I think the extreme cost associated with reclaimed lumber and, and architectural salvage is just because it's rare and scarce. And the more we bring to the market, the more accessible these materials can become. And there's a lot of stuff in a building. I mean, y'all, you won't believe how much there is in a building that can be reused, not until you've done it. You can look at a building all day long, but until you see it in actual piles, you have no idea how much, it still shocks me. I know they're working on siding in the field today, right now, and I'm excited for some people who are being trained today, right now, by my colleague, who have been looking at this building for days covered in siding to start taking that siding off and putting it in a pile because then they're going to really see you don't you just can't tell how much siding it is until you see it in a pile it's a lot there's so much that's good uh there's so much that is uh stuff that you can't buy today you can't go to home depot and get old growth heart pine flooring you just can't where are you going to go for this if you have an old growth heart pine floor what are you going to patch it with People who have shopped in architectural salvage to repair historic buildings for a long time will tell you that that is one of the toughest aspects is trying to do this shopping on the black market and in weird corners. And if there's no like legitimate companies in their area, then they've got to get online and just try to really hard to find what they need. Let's make it easy for people to restore their buildings properly. There's so much. We're, we just got to reroute it instead of putting it in the dump, bring it to a place where it can be, be processed and brought back into, brought back into use. I also love to talk, my absolute heart in all of this is actually in the trees. Uh, more than anything, I am obsessed with these old forests that we cut down to build North America. A lot of people don't even realize that uh, many of the species in historic buildings are now endangered or extinct. You can't, they don't, they're not here anymore. Like, for example, the American elm, which was wiped out by Dutch elm disease, or the longleaf pine, which is my favorite tree, and it was the dominant um, ecology here in my region, or I should say I'm in Texas now, but in Savannah where I live and work, that was the uh, dominant overstory. I mean, massive, massive miles and miles and miles and miles of longleaf pine and wiregrass forest. Beautiful tree, fascinating tree on the endangered species list, was logged almost to extinction. Uh, there are lovely groups working to bring this one back, such as the Longleaf Alliance, and we admire their work so much, but we have more biomass of this species of tree in historic buildings than we have left in the forest by a long shot. We are never going to see the conditions that these trees grew up in on our planet again, unless I hate to say it, our whole species dies off and we leave the planet alone for thousands of years to recreate these old growth wild forests. We're not gonna see this slumber again. So every time we put it in the garbage, we are wasting and shrinking that, that pool of resources. And of course, also the American chestnut. RIP wiped out by the, uh, the, the fungus, the chestnut blight. And I think it's also important in this moment to acknowledge that this isn't my, my heritage, this is Native American heritage. I'm the descendant of European colonizers. We came in, we decimated these forests to build our communities. Uh, and it's very disrespectful, I think, to take those materials, which were Native American heritage. This was, the, this was not our land and we, we harvested it all to use it. So let's show respect for these materials and let's acknowledge that this is native heritage as well as American heritage. Um, here's my little wood pun. This is a heart made out of a piece of heart pine. 
that's pine y'all like go to Home Depot and find me a piece of yellow pine that looks like that. You can't, it's very beautiful. It's very special. It grew very slowly. It grew in a dense forest. Uh, it grew in a rich soil and, uh, it, it, it produced a high quality wood unparalleled in what you're able to log in forest today. So, um, as I said, you know, we've done a lot of work to sort of align ourselves with existing preservation community. Savannah has a very rich, wonderful preservation community. People are very engaged with historic preservation here in Savannah, and that's awesome. Um, the web house, the one that burned that we were able to save, that was a game changer for us with the Historic Savannah Foundation. You know, that was it. They, they might have been a little unsure about what our role could be in preservation before that building happened, but afterwards they became one of our biggest advocates and they still really are. This lovely quote from a colleague over there says that what we do is a public good. They, of course, wish that we could save every building in place, but until that can happen, we have a lot of work to do to steward these things into their end of life. Um, I'm not the first person to think of this. I uh, am part of a really large growing national emerging industry that's working in, in deconstruction. The city of Portland was the first one to pass a law that required deconstruction instead of demolition. And there are a couple of really interesting things that we can talk about as a result of years of data gathering of this becoming the norm and demolition becoming illegal. Some of the most important ones are that in more than 50% of these buildings, additional hazardous materials were discovered in the course of, of deconstruction, which means hazardous materials were abated before the project was begun. We thought we got them all. And in half those buildings, we realized we didn't get them all. And we've got to pause and get more of those materials abated, which means that even if a building is getting abated before it's getting demolished, there are chances, chances are very good that there is more material in there, which is going to contribute to that air pollution that we couldn't even find in a bait. So really think about your neighbors with, with this one and who's breathing in that dust. Also, we have seen that success of this growing industry has meant that buildings, originally they were only being able to protect buildings from 1915 and older, and they've expanded that to include buildings from 1940 and older. So even more are being kept out of the landfill, and there, this is likely to extend again into probably the 60s or 70s. Uh, also, Portland has seen a decrease in the number of historic buildings that have been demolished as a result of this. Uh, if, if, if somebody doesn't want to deconstruct and they can't demolish, then they're just going to restore and repair. And we've seen that the, the, the result is that more buildings are getting saved and not fewer to assuage your fears that we're, we're coming after your historic buildings. We're not. We're trying to keep them. We're trying to keep them standing. Um, I want to talk about all these other cities, but I will, of course, spend a moment uh, talking about where I am right now. So Portland, Oregon. We've also got Palo Alto. We've got San Antonio, Texas, where I am right now. We've got Milwaukee, Wisconsin, a bit of a cautionary tale about how to do policy wrong. We've got Ithaca, New York is working on this. Uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And of course, Savannah, Georgia, where I live uh, and work on a coalition to try to advance the cause of deconstruction policy and protect our heritage materials. But I have to brag on the Office of Historic Preservation here in San Antonio, Texas. They have just passed one of the most comprehensive deconstruction ordinances that we've seen. It has been such a thoughtful effort. It has been done in collaboration with so many stakeholders in the community. It's a process that took over five years to accomplish. They did not copy and paste a piece of legislation from another city. They took the time to really create something that was going to work with their industry, as well as their communities, as well as their context in their history. And it is such a great example. Please go check out their website. They have a lot of information about this. Uh, we are here, my colleague and I are here training contractors in how to do deconstruction. These are contractors who have already had an interest in deconstruction or maybe haven't at all and just don't want to lose business now that demolition is illegal. They're awesome. They're such a good cohort. Hi, guys. Um, hope you're having fun taking the building apart today. Um, and uh, if you guys have any questions about this or if anybody has any questions about this, please reach out to Stephanie Phillips in San Antonio, Texas. She is a powerhouse. She got this done. She got this done in the deep south. This is a major win for preservation and a major win for sustainability and a hope a sign that more and more major cities, San Antonio was the seventh largest city in our country, definitely the biggest city to pass policy around deconstruction so far, huge deal and mad props to them. Um, screenshot this one if you're wondering how you can get involved. This is a dense slide and I apologize, I'm wrapping up here, but there is so much we can do to try to start 
moving the needle on how how this all goes. And I want to emphasize again that if preservation isn't taking the charge on deconstruction, then somebody else is. <laughs> and it, that that entity, organization, or individual might not be preservation minded. I know that there are deconstruction folk out there who advocate for the tearing down of historic buildings and who want to tell you that the highest and best use of a historic building is as materials and to just tear them all down and, and, and sell everything. And I, I stand fully in opposition to that mentality. And I don't want that person creating deconstruction policy in my community. I want to, I want to tie incentives to documentation. We've actually been lucky. We just had a new policy passed in Savannah that now anywhere in the city, if your building is of a certain age, if you're going to demolish it, you don't have to deconstruct it, but you do have to document it. You can't get your demo permit any longer without submitting documentation to the municipal archive. Yes, I can't take credit for that, uh, but I do like to think that our work in Savannah contributed to that thought process. Uh, and we're very happy to support our, our policymakers and work with them on growing more policy around protecting our built environment. I'm not gonna read all of this, but uh, great ideas in there, lots of room for work. You don't have to swing a hammer to get involved. You can definitely do this um, from any walk of life. So the ultimate goal, of course, is to replace this horror of horrors with this. Um, of course, my organization, we, we specifically focus on training women, and we say women plus, women, women identified trans non-binary people for careers in construction and deconstruction. And we also want to replace that horrible demolition where everything goes to the landfill with this, the creating of repositories of local, meaningful, sustainable, sustainably sourced materials, which are available to help you make not only beautiful finishes, beautiful furniture, but also just repair your historic home. Uh, here's my lovely crew. Um, this is a bit of an old picture. So we still have some of these folks. Some of these folks have moved on to brilliant, brilliant futures. We're so proud of our graduates. They not only live and work in the community in Savannah, but also have gone on to other cities where they're helping to grow the cause and spread the word. And we have some new trainees who aren't pictured here, but they're amazing. Everybody on our team is awesome and hardworking. Um, we're very proud. I have to always pitch and, and give props to my team because they really are, they're like the reason my life is good. Uh, and thank you, thank you for your time. I'm really looking forward to any questions. Love to chat about this. Obviously I can talk, so uh, please don't hesitate. Don't be shy. I'm looking forward to chatting with you all. Thank you so much, May. This was really inspirational. <laughs> All the work that you do and you speak about um, deconstruction so eloquently. Um, and I was making lots of notes of, you know, how to how to speak about this the way that we are intending as as a preservation um, tactic and not just a, a last resort. So thank you for giving us some language and and sharpening our perspective on how we are doing preservation work when we're deconstructing buildings. Yeah, you said it. So I would like to open it up to the floor if there were some questions. How often oh. do you get called to um, do trainings? Like well, you're in Texas now. Yes. Well, this is our first out of town training. Obviously we are constantly training in the city of Savannah all the time. You can't really hire people who know how to do deconstruction. They don't exist. So you gotta hire people who don't and train them how to do it. Um, so this is our first time traveling, but we're already talking to a couple of other cities about doing trainings after this one. I think it's gonna become a pretty core part of what your nonprofit does. Um, as it should be, this is sort of the natural growing. We've gained knowledge and experience in how to do this by, by the hard way, by making mistakes. So it's my absolute pleasure to impart the wisdom that we have gained to people who are just getting started. Uh, and I think it's, you're going to be seeing this more and more, and we will be happy to come to Connecticut, uh, and train y'all in, in how to do this. <laughs> I think we have to figure that out. Yes. <laughs> Great. Um, Nanette, you have your hand raised. Did you have I a did. question? Oh, I go did. ahead. Uh, can you find a deconstruction company that comes in and uh, removes a building uh, for free if they keep the material? Um, not in a garage, not a lovely stately home. Oh. Uh, very common question. We get asked that all the time. 
Um, I don't work for free and I can explain why, uh, obviously our, our, our work is heavily labor intensive. And so right. I want, I want my crew to be earning a living wage. It's not an easy industry. There's a lot of cost. We have high insurance burden. It's our second biggest expense. Um, but I will tell you that even though I'm going to charge you to remove your building, I can probably save you money. And that's because I'm a nonprofit and we can talk about this offline if you'd like, but I'll paint a quick picture. When you hire a deconstruction company, you're hiring them for the service of building removal. But if those materials are then donated to a nonprofit, which in my case is also us, but in other places, it's another a materials reuse innovation center or a hub of some sort, those materials have a lot of value. So we can get that, that donation appraised and it can make our clients, it can put them in line for what is in some cases a really sizable tax deduction. So that can often wipe out the entire cost of the service. I have clients who have actually saved money hiring us, even though we cost more than our demolition competitors. Does that make sense? So say a demo would cost you $5,000. I'm going to charge you $10,000, but you're going to get a $20,000 tax deduction. You've saved $10,000. Well, uh, if you're a nonprofit to begin with, what if you, you have no tax? So if you have no tax as a nonprofit, that does change the equation. Yeah. Also, a lot of low income peoples don't have a, a large tax liability. Right. So I can't speak for other companies, but I will tell you that I work with those clients. If the tax deduction doesn't work for them, I'm going to work on a sliding scale and I'm going to find a way to make this cost effective. I'm going to use whatever wiggle room in our margins we've been able to make on other jobs to fund the deconstruction that can't necessarily benefit from that. From that. And I'm not the only one who is going to go out of their way to make sure that whoever needs a building deconstructed can access deconstruction. So don't give up. If you feel like you've reached out to a company or two and you know, you've had a door shut in your face, keep reaching out. You're going to eventually connect with somebody who's going to find a way to help you. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. And Jordan just put a list of deconstruction companies in Connecticut in the chat. You can take a look at that, Nanette. Uh, maybe we had a question. Um, often buildings are deconstructed to move to a new, to be reconstructed on a different site. Do you do the reconstruction as well? I don't, but we do the deconstruction for reconstruction. And there's a couple of ways you can do it. Um, you can take the whole building apart into its materials, like, like what you see here, and then put it back together. But we also just did our first project where we panelized a building. We cut it into parts. So for example, the gable end of the roof and then eight roof panels along each side of that roof, stack them like pancakes, put them on a truck, move them to another place, put the building back together, just like a, just like a pop-up mm -hmm. kit or like a modular design build contemporary thing that you see architects working on nowadays. You can do this with old buildings too. We're very excited to be adding this to our service offering because sometimes a building is just too good to disappear. Sometimes it's in such great shape. You obviously can't do that with a building that's heavily compromised. It's not going to survive. Um, and that, in that case, it's going to become materials. But we just did our project called the River House, um, which is on River Drive on the waterfront in Savannah, was in the, in the way of a major high density waterfront development. And we were able to sell that building to a lovely buyer who is, who has another piece of land right in the neighborhood, who's going to rebuild it. So we don't provide that service but we will work with you <laughs> and your contractor. I mean, we had the contractor in that building before we started taking it apart. We had the building inspector who was going to be overseeing the rebuild in the building before we started taking it apart, doing everything we can to ensure the success um, of this project moving forward. Mm -hmm. That's great. And, you know, the building inspector that, you know, brings to mind, you know, <laughs> do you, Educate your local building inspectors. <laughs> we we often find that buildings have been, you know, their fate has been sealed because we can't get the building inspector to let us get in. Um, yes, that's real. Um, uh, yeah, we do. Uh, we're a small community, so we I know a lot of the building inspectors in Savannah. Um, if I don't know them, I know somebody who knows them. So we're able mm -hmm. to really do that on sort of a one-on-one -on -one basis. And we found our building inspectors to be quite lovely and really open and receptive. Actually excited that we're trying to do something innovative and different rather than just tearing everything down. Like I said, this is a history-obsessed town. So literally anything other than the landfill. And, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot to get people on board. But here in San Antonio, huge city, you know, million people, lots of 
code compliance officers and building inspectors. So how do you educate them all? Well, the OHP here, the Office of Historic Preservation here in San Antonio is offering trainings for building inspectors for how to, how to work with, and code compliance officers for how to work with communities and how to be knowledgeable about this new industry that they're bringing into the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant. Stephanie, who I keep bragging on, who I'm totally obsessed with, was just there yesterday talking to code compliance officers about what deconstruction is. And she said, she was very happy to report that mostly they were arms open and eyes open and ears open and really excited to learn about this. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That gives me oh. <laughs> encouragement. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Were there any last questions before we close for today? I, I have one. Oh, go ahead, Nanette. <laughs> um, uh, so how do you determine whether you need to deconstruct a building or save it? You know? I don't determine that. Okay. So I... Uh, <sighs> I'll help. I'll, I'll always advocate for a building if I think that there's any, if I think there's any wiggle room in in its fate to convince somebody to save the building in place. I'm going to try to do that. And I have talked my. I'm a bad businesswoman in the sense that I have talked myself <laughs> out of jobs on more than one occasion and convinced a person to save a building instead. Very proud of that. Um, but really, it comes down to who owns the building. Not every. In fact, most buildings are not in historic districts. Even. Even in our historic districts, they sometimes come down. We just recently had one in our National Register Historic District, which is downtown Savannah. It was built in 1830. This building, I mean, couldn't be more protected, and yet it still managed to slip through the cracks. And it was because it was owned by people who had absolutely no will to save it, and they wanted to develop the property instead. So we were very glad to catch that. Um, and, and not see it all go to the go to the dump. But it, it's not, I don't own the property, so it's not up to me. Um, it, it really is, we have to work with, I say sometimes we have to do deals with the devil. We have to work with people with whom we totally disagree. Uh, we have to work with people who want to tear down historic buildings. Those aren't my people, but in order to save the building, you know, we, we got to just, we got to work with what we've got. Okay. I guess my, I understand your answer, but I mean, is it worth saving? You know, sometimes it gets, is it too far gone? How do you determine that? Sure, that's just really an economic question. Uh, you can sit down and look at costs. You, okay. you, talk to a, you talk to a restoration professional, you can get an estimate for restoration and there's your number. And then you look at the economics of whether the building is gonna be income generating. Is it going to be um, sold? Is it, so are you gonna be able to demand a value in selling that building that will cover the cost of your having restored it? Or can you afford to live in it? You know, all of that is really, it's just numbers. Okay, thank yeah. you. No problem. I think Very any good. building can be saved. Honestly, I think I've seen some buildings that, that even yeah. preservationists are calling total loss. And I'm like, you could save this. But, you know, okay. it, it often is, it's economics. There's just not enough money to make it make sense. So that's mm -hmm. when they're, mm -hmm. you're welcome. And if you're a nonprofit organization, it could contribute to your mission to weigh that against your decision and the finances. So lots yeah. of factors to consider. 100%. Yes, there's a lot more value in these than just dollar value, right? There's, there's, like I said, there's meaning, there's community building, there's connection, um, and, and there's, there's public health. There's so many reasons why, so many things more than just that bottom line to, to consider when we're talking about our built heritage. Well, May, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for taking a break from San Antonio to, to zoom in with us. We really appreciate you sharing all of your knowledge and being such an inspiration too. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure. And anybody who's watching, please feel free to reach out directly. I'd love to chat with you. Thank you so much for your time. Wonderful. Thank you, May. Thanks everyone for joining.